architecture can physically alter your brain. So when I say that architecture has a profound effect on us, it's, it's not just a feeling or an intuition, there's actually a, a physical change to your brain. I'm sure we've all experienced this effect before. I know I certainly have. You know, I used to have an apartment here in Chicago that I, I absolutely hated. You know, my body would tense up as I went home because I just didn't want to be there. I, you know, I had these two huge windows in the back. They were the only windows I had in the apartment, and they had this great view. They looked straight out at a brick wall. It was, yeah, it was, it was awesome. Uh, so I got no natural light, no fresh air, nowhere to look, nowhere to go. It was, it was just it was a terrible place to live. And it affected me. It affected my mood, how I interacted with people, even how productive I was. It was just it was terrible. I felt like I was living in a cell. And quite frankly, I realized I started to act like I was living in a cell. Now this notion that our buildings affect us, it's something I've been interested in for a long time, and something I, I sought to study, you know, beyond this feeling, this intuition. And this took me to the world of neuroscience, which was lucky. It was, because it just so happens my brother's a neurologist, which made my research possible, quite frankly, because he was able to feed me all of the, these journals and studies and this research that otherwise I, I wouldn't have had access to. I, I wouldn't even have known they'd existed, really. And the more I poured through this research, the more I was just blown away by the parallels between architecture and neurology. All these architectural implications kept showing up in this neurological research. And it, was, it was like we were looking at, you know, trying to solve the same problems. We were just using a different language. So the cool thing about these studies, they all generally said the same thing, that our environments have a profound effect on our cognitive functions. So our cognitive functions, that's, you know, it's, our ability for creativity, learning, motor skills, attention, everything. And environments. So our environments have this profound effect on our cognitive functions. And that's the word they use in neurology. It's not architecture, it's environments. Enriched environments, specifically. And that, that's a concept that was created by a, a famous neuropsychologist, a Dr. Donald Hebb. And he, he came up with it one day when he decided to take some of his lab mice home and keep them as pets. And he got them home and quickly realized there was a change in their behavior and how they interacted with each other and with him. And so obviously, if you're a neuropsychologist, you quickly realize that clearly the change in environment must have changed their behavior and probably altered their brains. So I should look at this. So that's what he did. So he set up a couple of control groups. He had you know, the mice really in the, the lab setting, the, the sort of cold, barren, sterile setting, just kind of an empty cage. And then the other setting is what he called the enriched environment. That's you know, the cage he kept his pets in. So this cage, you know, you have that wheel to run through, some tubes to play in and go and explore with, other mice to hang out with. It's, you know, it's a really primo living environment if you're a pet mouse. It's where you want to be. So he, he let them live in these environments for a while. And afterwards, he studied their brains. And he found that the brains of these mice in the enriched environment, well, the cerebral cortex of these mice actually grew. Cerebral cortex, so that controls things like attention, learning, motor skills. Not just that the neurons changed. There, there was an effect on the neuronal configuration in the brains of these mice. Physical change. And it's not just a one-off experiment. Ever since he came up with this concept of an enriched environment, other neuroscientists have looked into this. It's been the subject of a, a lot of research and study. And you know, whether it's with mice or monkeys or even looking at the MRIs of humans. And they all, again, say generally the same thing, that our architecture, our environments, can have a profound structural effect on our brains. The design of these environments can alter your brains. The design, the architecture can change your brain. That's pretty cool. I mean, it kind of was shocking to me. You know, I would assume there'd be an effect, you know, some sort of effect, but a physical change to the brain? Couldn't help but think that's something that maybe, I don't know, an architect should have heard about or know about in some way. <laughs> I hadn't. So how does this work? Well, it begins with the neuron. Neurons are the cells in our brains that enable us to do everything from put one foot in the front of the other, to draw, to reason, to navigate through spaces, absolutely everything. And they enable us through a process called synaptic firing. Here's a video of that process. This is brain activity. When I'm firing on all cylinders, this is what's going on. This is how our neurons communicate. Key thing to understand about this process from an architectural standpoint is that it begins with a stimulus. So a neuron is stimulated and it creates an electric charge. 
And as you create this electric charge, it's contagious among the other neurons. So the other neurons see this, and they want to link up with that neuron and receive that charge. And as we do this, as we stimulate, more neurons come together, and they start to create these networks, the neuronal connections, and that's how they transmit that charge throughout our body. And these networks that we create through the stimulus, that's where we get, create, grow, strengthen our cognitive abilities. It's not just about creating and growing these cognitive abilities, or these networks, rather. General maintenance, just as important. Because you know, if you're not stimulating these networks, neurodegeneration does occur. You know, the concept of use it or lose it fully applies to your brain. So, we know this process, it begins with the stimulus. And we know from all these studies that our environment can be that stimulus. And of course, the environments we spend most of our time in is architecture. So we can start to think of architecture as the act of designing a neurological stimulus. Architects, those of us interested in how, did, how our designs affect people, can start to think of the brain as our client. So how do you do that? Well, for me, start with the brain. Look at the different areas of the brain and, and their cognitive responsibilities, what they control. So for example, uh, hippocampus. It's responsible for memory and spatial navigation, or maybe the cerebellum responsible for attention, motor learning. Um, basal ganglia, responsible for habit formation, so on and so forth. So I started to generate this list of areas of the brain and their cognitive responsibilities, and now I had this list, I, I had a list of my clients. So now I have to stimulate them. How do, I, how do I do that? How do you stimulate something that's responsible for spatial navigation by using architecture? So I thought through this, I started to generate a matrix. And don't try and read it, just for scale. Just give you an idea of what's going on here. So I'm charting areas of the brain and what they control, and then how I think I can affect those areas using architecture. And I tend to use this more as a map for how to design a neurological stimulus, because your goals are always going to be different. You know, if you're designing something, uh, a home for someone with Alzheimer's, it's going to be different than if you're designing an elementary school or if you're designing a, you know, a collaborative office for a tech startup. You're going to engage this and use this differently. And now as I, I looked through and started to create these architectural features and elements and how they'd affect the brain, the trend I started to notice is that I was designing dynamic environments. I was dynamic environments that are meant to be engaged. I was designing choices to be acted upon. I was designing options. As architecture, I call that kinetic design. So what does that look like? How do, how do we do something like that? Well, let's take a look at a few images and try and paint that picture. So you have a small house. And a small house can feel mundane. You know, your movements through it can start to be automatic because you don't have any choices. You are where you're told to be. If we start to design multiple ways to move through a space, you know, we start to design choices that feeling of claustrophobia or being confined can go away. And if we take a look at the matrix, we can see what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to use the architectural element of wayfinding as a way to stimulate your hippocampus, which controls spatial navigation. So again, the goal is to define or to design a neurological stimulus. So, these lures, look at how they, they bring color and light and shadow into the space and how the, those shadows and the light and the circadian rhythms will move through the space differently, how they'll reflect it in or how you can create an applied area in the distance that glows and draws your attention and brings you back and makes you want to explore. This invokes your sense of wonder. But it also stimulates your occipital lobe, which is responsible for processing vision, color, movement, orientation. The walls in this house are meant to be engaged physically. You know, so these louvered walls are made up of pivoting elements. They slide, they move, you can engage them. And as you engage them and peel back the layers of this wall, you're physically touching them and engaging them, but you're also thinking about the space that you're creating, the volume you're creating, what you're doing to the space, how you're altering it. You're also stimulating your occipital lobe, which is responsible for object manipulation and spatial mapping. And again, the house, you can keep opening it and changing it. The decisions you make to open it or close it, as you go through this process, your sensory experiences, they all change. You know, so the amount of light you get, the view you have, the amount of air or how you travel through the space, this, these experiences, they all change. And as you do that, 
you're stimulating your post-central gyrus, which controls sensory processing. And again, we'll step back and forget about the specific areas of the brain and just observe the space and how the look, the feel, the color, how you would interact in this space changes based on how you decide to reconfigure it, the decisions you make to alter the space. So kinetic design seeks to maintain and improve cognitive functions by engaging you. It seeks to engage you mentally, physically, visually, socially. So mentally, but by designing elements that you interact with, that you think about, that you make a decision about. Physically, by designing architecture you engage with operable features. Or visually, by designing options and views and lines of sight and color and circadian rhythms that travel through the space. Even socially, by how you would interact in that space, whether you completely open it or completely close it. So these designs, these ideas, that matrix, those are all my interpretation of how to create a neurologically-led architecture. I'm sure there'll be you know, plenty of debate to what extent we're engaging a certain area of the brain. And that's great. That's the conversation I want to have, even to the extent that I might be off of it. Because it's about this fusion of architecture and neurology that's important, because our architecture does have a profound ability to affect us. And with this fusion, we can start to understand that effect, and then we can address it. Great architect Richard Neutra, you know, many decades ago, he wrote about similar ideas, and he said that, you know, architects, we put a lot of effort into understanding the properties of the materials that go into our buildings. And we should. We should understand the properties of the steel that goes into our structure, because you, you want to know how that structure will respond to the design. But shouldn't we also put some effort in understanding the properties of who we put in our buildings, not just what, the neurological properties of the people that go into our buildings and how they will respond to the design. Aren't those properties maybe just as important? Another great architectural philosopher, Winston Churchill, made a, a remarkable neurological observation on architecture. You know, he was addressing parliament and he said that, we shape our buildings, and thereafter they shape us. Obviously, I completely agree. But I like to think that with this fusion, we can improve upon that statement, and we can change it. And we can say, with an understanding of neurology, we can shape our buildings so that thereafter they shape us for the better. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening.